I'd like to say good evening to everyone. Truly, it is an honor and a privilege to, to be back in the house of the Lord yet again. Study another portion of God's holy and divine word. For those who are watching us on Facebook and YouTube Live, we appreciate your attendance and let you know that we, you're always welcome here to come study with and worship with us here at the building. We're located at 1630. 24th Street North in the great city of Preston, Alabama, where our theme here at Preston is where Christ is King and faith works. Now we're going to start this evening with hymn 356, Won't It Be Wonderful Day. Hymn 356, Won't It Be Wonderful Day. Let us begin. When with the Savior we enter the glory land, won't it be wonderful there? Ended the troubles and cares of the story land. Won't it be wonderful there? Oh, now won't it be wonderful there? Having no burdens to bear over there. Joyously singing with heart bells are ringing. Oh, won't it be wonderful, wonderful there? We're walking and talking with Christ the supernal one. Won't it be wonderful there? Praising, adoring the matchless eternal one. Won't it be wonderful there? Oh, now won't it be wonderful there, having no burdens to over there, joyously singing with heart bells are ringing. No, won't it be wonderful there? Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we come before your throne this evening, thanking you uh, for the many blessings you have given us this day. We're thankful, Father, for your love and your kindness toward mankind, and that we deserve punishment, but you sent your Son to forgive us for our sins. We're thankful, Father, for the church uh, that God, that Jesus gave us a vehicle that we may uh, arrive back to thee one day. We're just thankful, Father, for the, all the things you've given us. We are thankful for the spiritual uh, blessing that you've given us also, open our eyes and enlighten us uh, of the things that pertain to spiritual understanding. And Father, we come this evening praying for those that are sick, asking that you will give them a portion of their health that they may be uh, returned, uh, and they may be able to come back and worship thee in spirit and in truth. Pray for those in the hospitals. We pray for those, Sister uh, Ellis, which is in the uh, nursing home. Pray for her strength. Pray for all that are at home sick, Father. Just ask you to be with them. And Father, we pray for forgiveness of sin, asking that you forgive us all the things we've done contrary to your will, uh, whether by commission or omission. We just ask you to cast those things far away from us. And Father, we pray for the Brother Brown tonight as he come forth to break unto us the bread of life. We ask that you uh, uh, give him a recollection of the things which he studied and prepared, that we may not only be hearers of your word, but doers. Father, continue to bless our nation, the leadership thereof, and we just ask you to bless not only that those are in, in the head of the government, but we bless those that associate with that government and those here in the local government. And we ask you to be with uh, the church and its leadership and its organization. Just ask you to continue to guide us and strengthen us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's see the last verse and then we'll be dismissed through our classes. Verse 3. There with the tempest will ever be sweeping us. Won't it be wonderful there? It's sure that forever the Lord will be keeping us. Won't it be wonderful there? Oh, now won't it be wonderful, wonderful there? Having no burdens to be over there, I'll joyously singing with heart bells are ringing. Oh, won't it be wonderful, wonderful there?
Good evening. We are finding ourselves again in the first book of Samuel. And we are getting down to the 17th, 17th chapter of the book. And if you uh, have your, your, your lesson textbook, <clears throat> you'll notice we are still on page 28. That's in lesson 6. But we're uh, dealing with uh, the section that talks about David's victory over Goliath. So now we're getting to some sections where we actually are beginning to recognize some of the stories. You know, some of the stuff that we've covered over the last few weeks. Uh, <clears throat> people will say, well, I, I, I never heard about that. Or, or well, I've, I've heard about that, but I hadn't really heard that much about it. But, you know, David and Goliath, the story I've never been told and told and retold, and, and uh, you had not been to church at all if you ain't heard about that. But <laughs> so we want to uh, uh, just uh, take a look at the de in depth of it and, and see some of the things, and the characteristics of the, the situation that's going on around this that uh, we may not be aware of, some of the details that are filled in that, that perhaps the the children's storybooks didn't share with you when you were a kid reading that, if, you, if your parents were of such that got you those books for, uh, to read. Uh, we finished up on, on chapter 16 on Sunday, and we were talking about how that, how that God, <clears throat> after having Samuel anoint David as king, and keep in mind, David probably is a teenager at this point. He, he, I'm going to guess, uh, you know, by all considerations, he's probably 15, 16, 17 years old. And here God has anointed him to be king over the entire nation. Uh, of course, as we go along, we will hear of other kings that actually assume the throne at very young ages. You know, even as young as 12, even you remember that David, David's son Solomon was pretty young. I'm uh, not sure he was that young, but he knew that he was ill-equipped mentally and maturely to, to run, a, run a country, and so that's why he asked God for wisdom so that he might be able to rule the people. But here David is, is, has been anointed king. Now, we know, if we know anything about the story of David, that he doesn't assume the throne for years, but he has been anointed king at this time, and he's still a very young man. In fact, they had to go get him from the pasture where he was watching sheep for his father in order to get him and bring him to the to, to the, the feast that they were having when they anointed him uh, because even his father didn't even consider him a viable candidate to be anointed king. He brought all the older brothers with him to the feast, but he did not bring David, and they actually had to send for him. And, and then the, the closing verses of chapter 16, we pointed out how that after God anoints David king, and certainly Samuel was concerned about going and, and holding this feast and, and anointing David because he said, if, Samuel, if Saul finds out about it, he'll kill me. You know, you're trying to subvert, you know, overthrow the government by bringing in a new king. Uh, and so he goes there under the pretense of doing sacrifice, and that's when he anoints David king. But, but even that, God starts working in that. And, and what did we say was the next thing that happened in Saul's life in this chapter? What, ha what started happening to Saul? He started going crazy. God took his spirit away from him and sent an evil spirit to torment him. And Saul just started having bouts of craziness, of me mental illness. <clears throat> He'd just get mad and start throwing stuff and wanting to kill people. And, and the servants got concerned because you never know when you might be the object of his anger. You know, when you've got a king who has the authority to do whatever he wants to do, and one day he wakes up and decides he don't like you no more, it could be ugly. And so they come to him and said, hey, why don't we get a, a, a young person who knows how to play a harp? And, and so whenever you're going through this issue, well, he'll come in, he'll sit down in front of you, he'll play some soft music and, and, and you know, just calm the situation down. And, um, and, of course, we got into how music changes the attitude of our lives and, and how that many times is, is, is what we what we what we listen to that shapes the mood in which we're in. And, uh, and so, you know, that's what happened. And God was working in there because all of a sudden when, when Saul says, you know what, I think that's a good idea. 
in one of the services, say, hey, I, I know the guy. I know the guy. And what do they do? They go get David because David knows how to play a harp. And now David is brought right into the palace to work with the king, and the king don't even know he's been anointed to be king. And so I ask the question that all preachers like to ask. Won't he do it? Won't he do it? God can do it, can't he? And nobody even knows. There are things going on in your life right now that you may not realize that God is doing to put you where he wants you to be. And we will fight God to the nail. We will pitch a fit. I don't know, we'll even blame God for sabotaging our lives. I don't know, here David being swept right into the palace, and, and it's not long before Saul gets mad at him and starts trying to kill him. And, and you know, can you imagine if you were there? I, I've been snatched away from my parents, my, my home, drug over here to the capital city, Every time that fool starts acting a fool, I got to go in there and play some music. And now he's trying to kill me. And you might ask yourself the question, what is God doing? This don't even make no sense. But God is working behind the scenes, and he is placing David strategically in a place where he will immediately assume the throne as soon as God is ready. Kind of remind you when Jesus came. The Bible says what? In the when the fullness of time was come. Not when I was ready, not when you ready, but when God got ready. And so we have need of patience that when God is working behind the scenes, just go on with it. Do the best you can where you are at what you got God has given you to do right then. And let Him work out the details. We got too many people who are jockeying for position. You got folks at your job who are trying to become your boss or the, 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 the manager or the supervisor, and they don't mind stepping on you to get there. And if God wants you there, don't fight with them. Just keep doing your job. When, 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 when the night is really dark, it's not that hard for your little candle to light up the light, light up the night it's when it's really dark. And so let's, we don't curse the darkness. We, we, we just light our light up. And that's what, that's what David is doing. He was a sheep herder. Had to, had to fight animals to keep them off the sheep. Getting left out of parties. They, all the other brothers going to the, to the feast, but he don't get to come. Now he's being drugged to the end so he can play a harp. And, and David didn't say, Man, I don't want to play no harp for no Okay, I don't want to do that. I'm, I, I'm, I'm a sheep herder. That's what I mess my job. I play the harp out there. You know, if somebody called you to sing at a, at, at, at a, for a wedding, you might be kind of hesitant to go, wouldn't you? You might say, you might say, I can sing pretty good in the shower. But that's because ain't nobody there listening. You know, David said, I play out here in the, in the, in the, in the, in the meadow with the sheep. The sheep don't mind. But he's being called to a higher calling, and there's no telling when we might get called to that higher calling. And so God moves him right into the palace, and he becomes the armor bearer for Saul. That means he's walking with Saul. He's working with In other words, God is giving him a firsthand look at what it looks like to be king. What better school could you get? So then we go into chapter 17. It's chapter 17 when we get introduced to the, the story of, of Goliath. Goliath is the, is the, is the, is the mighty Philistine of Gath. And, um, and, and David is, is, is brought into a situation where, where he now is, God is placing him in a situation where he can even elevate him even higher. We mentioned on Sunday that what God has, what God has said, he said, Let, uh, humble yourself. And he will do what? He'll lift you up. We humble ourselves. So we're going to look at uh, the first section of this. And we will start off with the first 11 verses and read that. Then we'll kind of break that up. That's uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17, starting at, at verse 1. And we will look at the section of that passage from verse 1 to verse 11. And now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle. And were gathered together at Shokoth, 
which belongeth to Judah, and pitched between Shokoth and Azka in the Esfidam there. Well, that's a long word there. Hey, they, they like to mess with you on these words here. And Saul <laughs> and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah and set the battle in array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side, and there was a valley between them. And there went out a champion of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. And he had a helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail. And the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. And he had greaves, had greaves of brass upon his legs and a target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron. And one, the one bearing a shield went before him. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are ye come out to sit your, ba your battle in array? Am I not, am not I a Philistine, and ye servants of Saul? Choose you a man for you, and let him come down to me. And if he be able to fight me with me and to kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall you be my, our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. And when Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistines, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Earlier in the, in, in the, in the chapter in the book, <clears throat> we heard where, the, where, where Samuel is talking about how that, how that Saul fought with with the Philistines all his, all, his, all, his, all his time he was reigning. It was a constant fight. And we even referred back to when, when Joshua and Israel were, were conquering the promised land, how they did not wipe out all the people. And God told them that if you don't wipe them out, they will constantly be a thorn in your side. They will, be, they will aggravate you all your days. And so certainly the Philistines are, are doing that. So there we are. We, we've been focusing on some other things, and now it turns back to to the concept of the constant struggle that they are having with their enemies. The Philistines are one of the, are one of the most violent uh, groups of people that, that were around. And, 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 and anybody know offhand about the area that they lived in? Yeah. If, if you were looking at the map, where would they be? It's been all in the news lately. Just keep, just keep, just keep naming some names. Gaza, absolutely. They, they, they're in Gaza. They are in Gaza. Yeah, yeah over right on, yeah, over, over yonder. There, on the other side, that, that big pond we got out there. And so, so, so here they are. The, the Philistines are right there by the by the land of Judah. They are camped right on the edge of it. They're, they're coming down and they're challenging them. They're, they're, they're going to war with Israel. They are trying to conquer some land. I don't know. You know United States get, gets a bad rap from people coming over here and taking all the Native Americans and putting them on reservations and taking land. And the fact of it is, is that people have been doing that ever since creation. Stronger is always subjugated and made servants out of the weaker ones. That's just the way man thinks. If I can take your stuff, I'll just take your stuff. And so that's what they're doing. They're coming in. Israel did it, didn't they? They moved into the promised land, didn't they, what they did? And then what God told them to do, go in there, take their stuff, kill them, wipe them out off the map. Man is, is in constant turmoil like that. And back before, I, you know, I think, I think with, the, with the size and the stability of the United States, we kind of get the impression that, that people are generally nice folks. And their folks just, you know, really deep down in their heart, they all just want to get along with each other and everybody be nice. The Bible is very clear that the heart of man is 
deceitful and wicked. And who can know it? I don't know, deep down inside of all of us is a huge propensity for evil. And it's only by the grace of God and, and, and our love and respect and willingness to serve him that keeps us from being the kind of evil that is all around us. Um, when you look at the Discovery Channel, you see animals attack each other and just tear each other all to pieces. Hyenas will just strip a carcass down while they're still hollering and screaming and trying to get away. And then we look at some folks on the news and we say, they act just like animals. Because that's what they do. Because that's the tendency. Here's what, God, here's what the, the Philistines were saying. We're coming in, Israel. We're going to take your land. And there ain't really no sense in us having a long battle about this and kill 30,000, 40,000 people. Goliath said, come fight me. If you can beat me, then my folks will serve you. You choose you anybody you want to choose. And if I beat him, then y'all going to be our servants. That way we won't have to sit up here and fight over and kill a whole bunch of folks. But the problem of it is he was only suggesting that because he was a monster. Do, do you see the description that is laid out in this passage? There went, verse 4, there went out a champion from the camp of the Philistines, the Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span. This man was almost 10 feet tall. He was a monster of a man. He had a helmet on that probably if he sat, somebody sat it on your head, you couldn't stand up. You know, they, they have all these big fancy crowns with studded with rubies and jewels that the, they set on the king or the queen of England's head when they cor coronate them. They said they can't leave that thing on very long because they break their neck. And they had to be very careful to set it on there just right and, and, and let them take a few pictures and then take it back off. But this guy was wearing a warrior's helmet. And that helmet, uh, he had a helmet of brass on his head. And then he said he was armed with a coat of mail. Does that mean he had letters stuck all over his chest? Somebody tell me what a coat of mail is. Chain link vest. Have you ever seen some of the old, old gladiator type movies and stuff of the of the of the Middle Ages when people were fighting? You had well, they didn't have guns back then, so so they wouldn't doing they wouldn't doing a uh, 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 bulletproof vests. So they, they had swords, right? And if you cut somebody, swing a sword at somebody, chances are it's going to cut them. And they're going to bleed death if they don't kill them when you hit them. And so what they would do, they would cover their bodies with, 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 with vests or clothing or clo coats that were, that had chains woven in and out. So that when you hit them with a sword, it, it can cut the metal. Now it hurt a little bit, just like a bullet hitting a, 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 a vest. It hurt because the impact would still be there, but it wouldn't cut you, so there wouldn't be the danger of killing you. And But you had to drape that all over you. And even some pictures you'll see where they had them hanging off their helmet down the backs of their necks and down the sides so that if you try to cut their neck off, it would, it would stop it as well. And then notice what also he had. It said that he had, he had greaves of brass on his legs. And that is big brass plate strapped to the front of his legs so that if you if he, he took a, a hit from a spear a tip or something like that, it wouldn't pierce his skin and, and, and cripple him. And then he had uh, a, another big plate of brass that went across his chest. So if you go back and look at some of the old pictures of Roman army, Roman soldiers and gladiators, you'll see this kind of, of, of dress uh, that, they would, that they would wear. And then he says that his spear was like a weaver's beam. And the spearhead itself weighed about 600 shekels of iron. And then somebody else had to carry his spear because he had too much other stuff going on. I mean, his, 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 his uh, shield. Somebody else had to carry his shield. So here's this big, huge dude with all this big old, I'm talking about, heavy equipment that he's hauling around, most of which, if you grabbed a hold of, you couldn't even, you couldn't even do nothing with it because it's so heavy. But this dude, if, if he's got that kind of equipment that weighs that much, what do you think his arms look like? Yeah, I mean, it's a mountain of a man. 
And you can see the results of what happened when he came out and said, hey, there ain't no sense letting our armies fight. Let me fight somebody y'all got. What did the Bible say that was the reaction of the king and all the rest of the people? They were scared to death. They said, no, they're shaking half to death. Because probably any one of those men were thinking that King Saul might say, you go fight him. Well, he fighting him. It's amazing. It's amazing. Just put yourself, I think the Bible draws us a really good picture to kind of put us off in this situation, the, the, the plot, the, the circumstance, the situation. And I've, I've never been, been threatened by a guy that big before. I thank God for that. But you could imagine that should something like that in your life come about, it would take some real deep focus for you to say, I know God got this. Wouldn't it? Would, it, would, would that be the very first thing you were thinking? I know God got this. Here you are driving down the road. You're cruising about 70 miles an hour on the interstate, and you notice you look up, see a diesel truck has crossed the median and is in your lane coming straight at you and only about 100 yards away, and it looked like he's doing 72. And you say, Yo, this looks bad, but I know God got this. That, Kenny, that, that's what you would say, wouldn't it? <laughs> but we, we are faced with and I know we, we look at that and we think I've never been in that situation before so I don't, I don't know what they were thinking but we've been in some situations and we know what we were thinking when we were in them and we had no 10 foot giant trying to kill, cut our heads off either but we've been in some situations where it just looked like the possibility of winning was just insurmountable and generally speaking, now some of us who are really good, good, godly folk may say that the first thought they had was, God, I know you got this. But most of the time, that is not the first thing all well, we've got. We start panicking. Our hearts start beating real fast. We start sometimes start saying things that we, we probably shouldn't say. And, 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 and we fall apart. It takes a great deal of faith and, and a lot of experience in life to hold it together under very dire circumstances. But when we get through it and we get out on the other side and we calm down and we kind of chill in one afternoon, you know, on the couch watching TV, we, we can think, you know, God took care of that, didn't he? Man, that, that wasn't nothing to that. Man, that wasn't even nothing. I don't know why I was so excited, man. I mean, you know, that, that wasn't even nothing. God got that thing. But that's not what we're thinking when we're going through it. Let me tell you what we're thinking when we're going through it. Verse 11, when Saul and all Israel heard the words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now that is putting it mildly about how we're feeling when we're going through stuff. We're scared to death. We think this is it. I don't see how I'm going to survive this. God, I don't know what you're doing, but, I, but this, this don't even look fair. This don't even look fair. But God is placing things in our lives to bring out who we are and where we are in our walk with him. It's powerful to see once you've gotten on the other side of the mountain, just how strong God has made your legs to be able to climb that hill. Because there's going to be another mountain that comes up here in a little while that you're going to have to climb. And it's probably going to be a little bigger, a little rougher. And you have to learn to do difficult things so that you can do difficult better. We that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not please ourselves. What's the next line, somebody? Oh, I'm, I think I quoted that wrong. If a man be overtaken in the fall, you which are spiritual restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. Now give me the next line. Considering yourself, because next time it'll be you. You learn to do difficult things so that you can do difficult better. God is not going to smooth the mountains out in your pathway. He's not going to elevate the valley so you don't get down. You have to go through the valleys. You got to climb the mountains, and the mountains tomorrow and next year will probably be a little bit higher and a little more rugged than the ones you're climbing this year. 
but it probably won't seem like it if you walk with God because you'll learn to do difficult better. And that's what, that's what God is doing with David. That's what he's doing with David. He is putting David. He, David has been fighting lions and, 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 and wolves and, 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 and bears. They ain't got no battle strategy. They ain't got no, no spears and they've got no, no helmets. And, and when he gets through that, then now God is bringing him to some other creatures that he's going to have to fight. And the question is, does David get scared like the rest of the nation? Or does he stand on the faith that God has built in him? Under my, I, feel like, I feel like God trying to say something. What do you think? The, the thing of it is that, that we... We say, I don't think David's the only person that loves the Lord in this place. Saul is, we know he don't care nothing much for him. He wants to do his own thing. But he, so he, we can understand why he's scared. God has already took his spirit away from Saul. There's no protection on him. Saul ain't about to go out and fight the lion, fight Goliath. But you got a bunch of other guys who are mighty men of valor, who are warriors, who are who are strong, who who probably are well respected by the other. They got commanders and, and generals and so forth out there that 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 are that are teaching guys how to fight. And they all scared. Because ain't none of them had no guy this big to fight with before. And so they're they're trembling, they're they're afraid, they're they're dismayed. But what does it mean to be dismayed? Okay, I think that, that factors in some of it. But dismay also brings on the, the attitude of, I don't understand what's going on. Why is this happening to me? And, and that's sometimes, I think, when things hit us right, that's, that's the very first thing. I've been serving God. I've been trying to do the right thing. I have been doing what he asked me to do to the best of my ability. Why is this happening? And we usually say that by the time we start breaking out in tears, don't we? Because it sounds like to me God ain't being fair. And the fact of it is that life ain't fair, is it? It ain't fair. And when God gets through blessing you, money, he does other folks, and that ain't going to be fair either, is it? But we're not asking for fair because if we got fair, God would throw us in hell, wouldn't he? If, he, if we got fair. And we ain't interested in that. We want mercy. We want grace. And so... Here he is. He is faced with this thing. We've got this. And, and, and the Bible draws this picture of the insurmountable, unbeatable opponent. And life many times becomes that unbeatable opponent. And it doesn't matter. It could be two-legged. It could be four-legged. It could be a circumstance, a situation. It could be anything. But, but we will run into Goliaths in our lives. And the question is, do we shake and tremble? Or do we say, God got this? And it's going to take us going through some times where we shake and tremble before we can finally accept the fact that, you know, God does indeed have it. All right. So, so picking up at, at, at the next, after verse 11, we, we will see where, where David winds up getting sent to the battlefront. <clears throat> Starting at, at verse 12, and um, let's see, and this tablet wants to reset itself for me. Uh, <clears throat> we'll go down through verse 31, and we'll start. Now we're getting introduced to David again. Verse 12 says, and now David was the son of that Ephrathite of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse. And he had eight sons. And the man went among the man went among men for an old man in the day for for an old man in the days of Saul. So here he is. They're introducing us to, to David's father, Jesse. Je Jesse was a man among men. Uh, he he had eight, he had he had eight boys. Great asset to the nation. And the three eldest sons of Jesse went and followed Saul to the battle. And the names of his three sons that went to the battle were Eliab, Eliab, the firstborn, the next was Abinadad, and the third was Shema. And David was the youngest 
and the three eldest followed Saul. But David went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. We said he had been serving in the palace, playing the music for, the, for Saul when things were getting rough. So he's, he's taking a break, and he's going back home. And the Philistine drew near morning and evening and presented himself 40 days. Sometimes when the Scripture only covers something in a few verses, we think it wasn't, didn't take very long. It happened real quick and was over with. Forty days this guy is coming out, hollering and screaming at them, telling them that, uh, that he wants to kill them. And Jesse said unto David his son, Take now for thy brethren an ephah of this parched corn and these ten loaves, and run to the camp to thy brethren, and carry these ten cheeses to the captain of their thousands, and look how thy brethren fare, and take their pledge. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. And David rose up early in the morning and left the sheep with the keeper and took and went. And as Jesse had commanded him, he came to the trench as the host was going forth to fight and shouted for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array, army against army. And David left the carriage in the hands of the keeper of the carriage and ran into the army and came and saluted his brother. And as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion of the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines and spake according to the same words. And David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. The men of Israel said, Have you seen this man that has come up? Surely to defy Israel is he come up. And it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. David spake unto the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that kills this Philistine and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? The people answered him after this manner, saying, So shall be done to the man that kills him. We'll stop right there, verse 27. And then we get into his, uh, his brother getting a little attitude with him there. So, so backing up and, and, and taking a look at, at where we are, David is getting sent to the, to the, uh, the battlefield. <clears throat> his father's got some boys out in, uh, in, in the military. It, it stands to reason that he would be concerned about how they're doing. Uh, we we saw all over the news here these th those three young people they got they got killed here just recently, and probably seen some interviews with their parents. You know, you, you got you got to be tortured when when your children are at war, uh, and and you don't know if they're going to survive or not. And so time is passing by, months have gone by, and they're they're still at war. And, and Jesse is wanting to know how the boys, how his three oldest boys are doing. And so he sends David out there. He said, here, take some food. What, what, what do you call that when you get, get, get a package of food in the military? A care package, yeah. Said, Somebody done mailed you some, some stuff, you know. And, uh, and you're excited because, number one, you, you heard from home. Probably got a letter in there somewhere. And you also got some food that is a little different from the rationing that they give you in the military. And so that's what, that's what David's father is doing. And so while David is there, he hears the same thing that the other people hear, doesn't he? Here's the same thing. Forty days are going by. Day after day after day. A month and a half is going on. And this guy is coming out and terrorizing them every day. That's a terrorist, isn't it? <laughs> was a, that was a terrorist. The Philistines had some terrorists back then too, didn't they? And he's terrorizing these guys. He know, I, bet he's t I bet he tickled to death. I can, I can hear him now. He said, I'm going to go back out there and make it sit. Just see how hard, uh, how much the ground shakes when them jokers start trembling. And, and the Bible says that when they saw him coming out there, they started running. Under, they've been out there fighting and they're brandishing. They said, well, come on now, we're going to fight y'all. You know, y'all ain't coming into our country. And the guy walks out and starts talk, talking junk to them and they take off running. Kind of like the, you know, the little loud mouth on the playground. You know, he get to run in his mouth until somebody comes up and runs up on him with the jack him up, and then he takes off. Or the little crazy dog in the neighborhood, and, uh, you pick a stick up and chase him. The, the fact of it is, is that 
when David sees this, somehow or another, David hears something different than everybody else is hearing. What is David's response to it? Everybody's saying, did you hear what that guy said? Did you hear what that guy said? I can see all of them running around. David looking at, what what y'all running for? And he starts getting an attitude. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he has the right, he has the audacity to defy the armies, not of Israel, not of King Saul, but of the living God? That helps us put things in perspective. If every time we go through something that's really difficult, we can identify the fact that they're not attacking me. They're attacking God. It changes our whole perspective. I mean, now you start feeling sorry for God. You messing with God. I don't care how big you are and how bad you look and how much weight you got behind you. You define the armies of the living God? Now you got to be crazy. And so David starts doing, you know, he said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. The folks are obviously so scared that it gets to the point that Saul has to say, I need somebody to fight him. I tell you what, any of y'all bad enough, I'll let you marry my daughter. I, I make I make your whole family free in Israel. Y'all don't have to pay no more taxes, and, and y'all just, just do what you want to do. In fact, I will give you a whole bunch of money on top of it. Who wants to do it? And they're probably thinking, that, that ain't going to mean nothing to me if I'm dead. <laughs> that don't mean nothing to me if I'm dead. <laughs> kind of reminds me of one of the old Clint Eastwood movies. You know, he's the toughest gunslinger out there on the West, and some dude wants to call him out. And he said, uh, he said, son, you 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 want to fight me? Yeah, yeah, I, that's where I make my living. He said, he said, dying ain't much of a living, son. <laughs> dying ain't much of a living. You can get all this. And, and, and still, Saul was getting no takers. Nobody was willing. And David starts asking the question, what did you say? What did you say he would pay the guy that goes out here and do that? David started looking at the, probably looking at his, he probably been up there playing that harp, but he hasn't seen his daughter a time or two. David said, I'll fight him. And, and so, but the thing that David is looking at that is different from the way everybody else is looking at is that he, he doesn't need to be that strong. He doesn't need to be that powerful. He doesn't need to have that kind of weaponry because he has God. The Bible asks the question, who is he that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good? That is known as a rhetorical question. The, the, the writer isn't asking us to name somebody that could harm you because the obvious answer is who? Nobody can. Nobody can harm you if you're following God unless God wants them to. And then they can't harm you because God's not going to allow harm to come to you. Jesus would say, you know, don't even worry about the person who can kill the body. That ain't hurt you if you're following God. You wouldn't worry about the person who can, after they kill the body, cast your soul in hell. That would hurt you. But if you're following God, there's just no way in the world that somebody can hurt you. One of the most powerful things that when I came to realize this, but Cash and I talk about it all the time. You and I, and anybody else for that matter, is not going to live one second longer than God intends for them to live. But notice something else. You're not going to die one second sooner. So it really doesn't matter who is attacking you. What can they do to you? Because if God has decided that today is my day to die, 
It don't matter if you're trying to get me or somebody else. What, what difference does it make? I'm like, hey, I could just go to sleep and it would be my time. But if my time ain't for 10 more years, what you going to do to me? You can't hurt me. Satan even realized that Job had a hedge of protection around him. That Satan could not hurt him. I don't care what he wanted to do. Satan even realized that. In fact, he tried to use that in, in a way to, to, to embarrass God. Yeah, really? Job ain't serving you because he loves you, not for real? Come on, please. He's serving you because you protect him. Now, you take the protection away from him, he'll curse you to your face. And, and our realization is, is that if we can come to grasp, we can I'm not just know it from a philosophical position, but actually buy into the idea. There's nothing that anybody can do to me because God got protection around me. You can say what you want to say. You can do what you want to do. You can try what you want to try. And I'm not even going to worry about it because I know you can't do nothing. And it goes back to the idea of, you know, if you had a five-year-old grandchild, you walk in from work one day and that child said, Big Daddy, bite you. You're not going to break down no karate stick. So I'm going to get you. I'm going to break your neck. You're not going to do that. You're going to grab it. You know, because you're not scared of them. You know there's no danger of any hurt, harm. It's the same way it is with everything else. The, the fact of it is, is that if we really buy into the idea that God has us and he has protected us, he's put a hedge around us so that then we don't have to worry about what anybody else is going to do. Who is he that will harm you if you be followed today? Well, Paul is saying there's nobody that can do that. Nobody can harm you. David understands this idea. He has grabbed that idea, and, he, and he's been using it for the last several years because he was protecting his father's sheep, and whenever an animal came out to get one of them, David didn't turn and run and say, oh, well, we just lost another one. He would go and grab that joker and kill him and protect his father's sheep. And he realized that he was doing it under the power of God. And so here he is. He's asking the question, what, what is going to happen to the guy? Who, who defeats this, this giant. And he's going around and people are saying, oh man, this is going to happen, this is going to happen, man. This gonna, <laughs> the king is so desperate right now, he'd about give you anything if you can just take care of this problem. David goes through so much. Picking up at our section where we stopped at verse 27. <clears throat> that his older brother hears him. And he gets mad at him. Notice verse 28. And Eliab, Eliab his, oldest, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, Why come thou to hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the naughtiness of your heart. You are come down here to see the battle. And David said, What have I now done? Is there not When people want to ridicule you, when they want to plant seeds of doubt in your mind, they will attack you. And then they will try to bring out stuff that will embarrass you so you'll shrink back. We call it in our culture now, they, 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 want, you, they, want, to, they, they want to cancel you, stop you from talking. And so he live goes straight at him. He gets mad. I don't know why he's mad. Maybe he's mad because he's a little embarrassed. My little brother is going to fight the dude, and I'm scared to fight him. I don't know. That, that would probably make you a little, little, little in, insecure. And so he, he's, he attacks him by saying, why did you even come down here? And he wasn't asking the question as to say, hey, man, why are you here? You, you're too young to be out here. You don't need to be here. What are you doing out here? Let's get you back to safety. That wasn't, that wasn't the attitude that he had. He said, what are you doing out here? I know you. You just one nosy little rascal. All you want to do is come down here and see the battle. And then he starts trying to be sarcastic and mean. 
Now, who would you lead them a few sheep with anyway? Notice he said a few sheep. You ain't even got a very big flock to watch, man. Get on back out of here. I, I, it is real easy for us when people begin to attack you to, to kind of shrink back. Because they will, if they know you very well, they will try to point out things that you are sensitive toward. You know, if you've got a kind of a, a weakness of something, or if you're self-conscious about something, or, or, or you, you know, you know if, if you, you ain't got a, a big job that makes as much money as they do, they'll point that out. If you don't live in a, in a nice neighborhood like they did, or your house ain't quite as big as theirs. I'll never will forget, years ago, we were up at the fire department. I'm president of the fire department you know, in the community. And one of the guys that didn't like me very much, <laughs> he, was, he was trying to, you know, come to one of the meetings and publicly embarrass me while I was doing it. And, and he said, he said, and, and you live in a Habitat house. So, okay. And your point is? What, difference, what does that got to do with anything? We're talking about the business of this community, and you're talking about what kind of house I live in. What, what difference does that make? But people will do that. They will try to, well, you, you don't even, uh, good graphics there. It, you, 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 don't even, you don't even make the kind of money I make. Look at you. You, you, don't, even, you don't even come from a family that my family is. And, and, and they will point out things that, you, that they know you are self-conscious of or that at least they may feel you are self-conscious of, just so you will start in your mind reflecting on something other than the issue that's going on. Yeah. So that you'll quit doing whatever they don't like that you're doing. God is, is, is working in us. God is working in David. He is about to give a deliverance to Israel. And you know what you would think? That as scared as them guys are out there on their battlefield, they would be excited for anybody to take on this project. But it's often, and they see that working in the church, you can see it working in the community, you can see it working on your job. The moment somebody comes along that begins to do more than you were willing to do, and all of a sudden, you get you get an attitude toward them. They don't come on here and just start taking off. I don't know what they what they think they are. They, they they ain't been on this job ten hot minutes, and now they think they calling shots. I don't know why the supervisor is listening to them because they they ain't been here long enough to know anything. I, I, our struggle has got to be. It it ain't about me. It ain't about me. It's about God. And if God chooses to work through me, then I'm satisfied. And in fact, you ought to be satisfied too. You know, Paul raises the question when he's talking about the, the sovereignty of God and, and how God sometimes chooses to do whatever it is that he wants to do. Where he condemned Pharaoh, overthrew his armies, and drowned them in the Red Sea. And he said, and, and he raises the question, does the, does the pot have the right to ask the potter, why did you make me like this? If God wants to do what he wants to do and he decides to make you a queen and, and set you on, on the throne somewhere, that's his business. And I ain't got no right to say, well... I'm better than she is. Why are you doing all that for her? Why are you pass me up? I should be the one. That, that's the human tendency. Because I can tell you, as smart as I know I am, I know ain't none of y'all going to be able to pass me. That, that's the human tendency, isn't it? To, to believe in myself that I'm better than everybody else. But again, we got to understand, it ain't about me. It's about God. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Yeah. Their very life was held in the palm of his, his hand. He could have had them put to death just like that. But, but the fact of it is, is that as human beings, as, and then all of us got some f- sort of ego. All of us got some. You know, if, you, if, you, if you ever decided you want to be a preacher, it's probably because you got a little ego. That's probably the only reason why you keep doing it, too, because you got that, that motivation to keep pushing you forward. But the fact of it is, is that there's nobody that thinks, oh, yeah, they're, be- they're way better than I am. Let them have it. Not if it's something you really want. And so God is working in us to try to help us to see it ain't about me. It ain't about me. If salvation can come through you, then I'm happy. If God's blessing can be poured out from a child, okay, let's do it. Whatever it takes so that the kingdom of God can move forward. That's what we've got to believe in. Because men die, but God's purpose never does. One day you and I will be gone, and they will be struggling to remember what our names were. And God's purpose will be rolled and gone. And so salvation and, and victory and, 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 and success can come from God through anybody. And many times... It will come from the person we least expect it to come from. Because what did God say about when he anointed David? And he rejected those older brothers? Eliab may be still having kind of kind of a little bit tenderhearted from that. He, he may be a little feeling some kind of way from that. Because God said, no, no, he's not the one. Samuel said, oh, yeah, surely this guy is the one. And God said, oh, no, he's not the one. Go find David and get him out the sheep sheep pen and bring him in here. And so Eliab is is chastising him, saying, you need to go on back to the house and watch those little sheep. That's that's the most important thing you got on your agenda. What you doing out here? He didn't know that his dad had sent some food with him. But there's going to be times when we're going to be questioned about what is our position? What are you doing here? Certainly God could pick somebody better than you. But God has somehow or another, he kind of feels like he got the right to decide what he want to do. And we got to be good with that. If God wants to elevate someone above you, and the Bible says you, you rejoice with them, not feel envious toward them, but you rejoice with them. And our effort should be the same as, as what God is doing through David. It didn't really matter what the brothers did or said or any how they felt. God was going to do with David what he decided he wanted to because he said, I have found a man who is after my own heart, and he will lead my nation. And so it really didn't matter how old David was. God was working through him, and it would behoove the older brother Get with the program. Because God can move you out of the way just as easy as he can move somebody past you. It, it, it's, it's, it's powerful when we, when we look at the, the, the details of the stories that are, that are written in, in the Bible about what, what God is, is telling us. It, it just brings back to mind what Paul said in Romans. Those things which were written before were written for our learning so that we through patience and comfort of the Scripture might have hope. It's when you dig off into these stories and you see all the, you know, these people aren't, aren't larger than life. They, they, David and Eliab and Saul and, 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 and Goliath are just common, everyday folk just like you and I. They're going through life. They're trying to get over. They're trying to get ahead. They're trying to be successful. And it's only when you and I can see ourselves working in the plan of God that's where a real success can come from. But, but it's a struggle for us to humble ourselves and be willing to let God use us when he gets ready to use us. And not before. Questions, comments before we before we wrap it up tonight. All right. Thank you very much. There's a happy land of promise. Oh.